Our text this morning comes from the very last part of Matthew's account of the gospel. Sometimes this is called the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. We're going to start with that text. We will end with that text today. Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> this, of course, is after His resurrection. He will soon be ascending to heaven. And in Matthew chapter 28, it's called the Great Commission because it's given to everyone. It's not limited in any respect. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Even to the end of the age. He commanded His disciples to go all over the world and make other disciples. That was what they were to do. And this commission is still relevant. It's still valid. He says, I'm going to be with you all the way through the end of the age, so I want you to do this until I come back. He says, I want you to make disciples. But just exactly... What does it mean to be a disciple? What, what does discipleship entail? How can I tell a disciple? What marks do they have? What qualities and characteristics does a disciple have? And so the first question we're going to look at then is what is the definition of a disciple? Basically, in the Greek language, the word disciple means a student or a pupil. In other words, a learner. And many of us are in the education field and we know what a student or a pupil is. That person is there to learn some particular topic, some particular subject. In Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, he defines it as one who follows another's teaching. So it's a person who patterns their lives after someone else. In other words, it's like sitting at someone's feet, listening to them, and following their teaching. Jesus mentions this very concept of disciple in Luke chapter 6. And let's read that verse together. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. <clears throat> These are the words of Jesus Himself. And His definition of a disciple. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Notice the concept there, what it means to be a disciple. He's perfectly trained, and he's going to be what? Like his teacher. So therefore, a disciple of Christ, then, is someone who's patterning their lives after Christ, who's trying to transform their lives into the life of Christ. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Rome, mentioned this idea of what it means to be a disciple. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes to them, <clears throat> and let's read verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. <clears throat> this, of course, was written to the disciples, the Christians, and the church at Rome. He says in verse 29, <clears throat> in talking about God, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. What does it mean to be conformed to someone's image? You know, James talks about this in James chapter 1 when he says, you know, you look into the perfect law of liberty, and what do you do? You follow what it says, and you become more and more and more like it. So it's like, you, uh, you start out, when you look in the mirror, you don't see much of the image of Christ in you. But over time then, daily, weekly, monthly, that image in the mirror looks more and more and more like Christ. So a disciple is to pattern their lives after Christ so that they become more and more like Him. His attitude, His spirit, His way of thinking, 
That's what it means to be conformed to His image. We want to become like Christ. So a disciple of Christ is a pupil, a learner, a student, a follower of Christ's teachings. And they put those teachings into their lives. They apply them so that they become more and more like Christ in all that they say and do and think. So that leads us then, how can we identify a disciple of Christ? And what does it mean if we're really following Christ? And, and what does it mean about being a, a disciple? I narrowed it down to one word, and that's commitment. Commitment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> Paul stresses this concept of discipleship. And I think it's critical for us to understand that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 <clears throat> and we'll read a few verses there beginning in verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> Paul knew about discipleship. He knew about what it would cost to be a disciple. And notice what he says in verse 8 about being a disciple. And notice the dedication and commitment he talks about. Paul says, we, his disciples, are hard-pressed on every side yet not crushed. We, His disciples, are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's us conforming to His image as disciples. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Notice the dedication he's talking about. Notice the commitment he says it takes to be a disciple. And so someone who is dedicated, someone who's committed to being a disciple will live and act and talk and think in a certain way. And there's marks that tell us what a disciple is like. What is a committed person who's following Christ like? What do they look like and what do they do? Number one, they're diligent in knowing the words of Christ and abiding in them. Number one, John chapter 8. Jesus is talking to disciples in John chapter 8. <clears throat> and notice what he says they must do. John chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 31. Verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, If you abide in My word, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What are they? They know the truth, and then what do they do with it? They abide in it. You know, this, this doesn't have any power just to read it. It doesn't have any power at all just to read it. He says, if you abide in what it teaches, that's an entirely different story. He says, my disciples not only know the Word, but they abide in it. You know, the worst thing to see in the world is, is someone that claims to be a disciple. And you might be able to quote verses, him or her, but they, they never live it at all in any way. Don't even try to live it. Jesus says, my disciples will know my Word and abide in them. And that's the difference. They abide in them. They follow them. They put them into their lives. They practice them. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, <clears throat> he tells them about that word abiding in them. You know, we talk about this verse a lot as far as, uh, as singing, uh, but notice what the first part of the verse says. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, that means everything, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What's a disciple going to do? They're going to let the word of Christ dwell in them. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in them. That means, of course, you have to know it first, but that's not sufficient. You have to live it. In other words, that word has, has so saturated you that that's how you live. It's soaked into you. That's abiding in the Word. That's letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So it's, it's going to God's Word and knowing how to act, knowing how to talk, knowing how to think, having the right spirit, having the right attitude. We talked a lot about that in our morning class. Our attitude and spirit and how critical that is. Well, a disciple has the right spirit and attitude. Why? Because they're conforming themselves to the Word of Christ. We see His image up there as it's presented in the New Testament and we're conforming our lives to it. And that picture gets clearer and more distinct and fuller the longer we abide in the Word. And ultimately, uh, we, we want to be perfectly trained so that we become like His image. So when we look into the mirror, we don't see our wants and desires and, and so forth. We see Him. Paul talked about that, you know, uh, in Galatians chapter 2 when he talked about <clears throat> it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, that's what Paul was doing. Paul says, I don't want people to see me. I want people to see Christ. So a disciple not only lets the Word dwell in them, but it dwells in them richly and they abide in the Word. And as a result, that has saturated their lives to the extent that now they live like Christ would live. The second mark, the second characteristic is diligence in loving Christ's disciples. In John chapter 13, Jesus mentions this, and, and you'll recall the context of John 13. <clears throat> Him and his apostles, his closest disciples, are in the upper room in Jerusalem. In hours, he's going to be crucified on the cross. There's a lot of last-minute things he needs to tell them. And, of course, that's when he institutes the Lord's Supper. That's when he washes their feet. He talks about unity. So in John chapter 13, notice verses 34 and 35 because he's telling them about what kind of love they need to have for each other. John 13, verses 34 and 35. <clears throat> He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. And he says, this is the extent, this is how I want you to love one another, as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, in other words, by this love that you have for each other, all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. There's a mark of, of discipleship. If you love one another the same way to the extent that I've loved you. So after Jesus is gone, He wants them to know, this is the example I want you to have. If you're going to be conformed to my image, I want you to love one another to the same extent that I loved you. It says, then the world's going to see that you're really my disciples. And that's discipleship. He goes on, the third thing now, Diligence in bearing fruit. John chapter 15, just a couple pages over in your Bible. <clears throat> so we, we know the Word, we abide in it, we love each other. And the third characteristic, <clears throat> verse 4, Christ says to His disciples, Abide in Me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in in me. Verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. That you do what? Bear much fruit. What kind of fruit is he talking about? Well, one thing we certainly know he's talking about is the fruit of the Spirit, right? In Galatians chapter 5. You know, peace and joy and love and gentleness and humility and self-control. If I'm conforming myself to his image, 
then that's what I'm going to do. That I'm going to be displaying, I'm going to be exhibiting, I'm going to be showing love and joy and peace and self-control and humility. I'm going to be bearing good fruit. Why? Because I'm abiding in Him and His words are abiding in me. Just like He said. He says, that's being a disciple. You know the Word, you live by the Word, you love each other, and you bear fruit. He says, that's what being a disciple is about. It's not about what the world thinks of you. It's about what God thinks of you. And the last point I want to make is that it comes with a cost. We've defined what it means to be a disciple. We've looked at characteristics of being a disciple. But now we have to understand that being a disciple is costly. And Jesus, when he was teaching others in the first century, he never let on that it was going to be an easy road. He always made sure to understand that it was going to be a cost. There was a cost involved in being his disciple. In Matthew chapter 10, he talked about one cost involved in being his disciple. And it was a major cost. Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> notice verse 37. <clears throat> He who lo loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus said, I must come before your family. I must come before your family. He says, that's a cost you're going to have to consider to be my disciple. Are you willing to do that? Put me before your family. But he says that's not the only cost. In Luke chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 23, <clears throat> he says in verse 23, Then he said to them all, talking to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Jesus says we have to put our wants and desires below. They can't come first. He says you've got to take up your cross daily. You don't, you don't think about what I want. You don't think about all of these desires and passions, you put what Christ wants first. He says that's a cost of being a disciple. And we have to be willing to bear it. Jesus never sugar-coated being a disciple. He never soft-soaped discipleship. He always told them that there was a cost involved. And if you remember, one of the times in John's account of the Gospel... He had been talking to them about a number of these issues, and what did some of them do? They went back and never walked with him again. See, the cost was too much. And it's significant what Jesus did not do. He did not go after them. He let them go. If they weren't willing to pay the price, if they weren't willing to, to pay the cost, he didn't want them to be a disciple. Again, going back to commitment, going back to dedication. Understanding this life is not what it's all about. It's the future. So how does one become a disciple? We go back to our text, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Teaching them to observe all things. The only manual we have to learn how to be a disciple is right here. Jesus said you have to believe in me, but that belief has to have a foundation. And the foundation of our faith is that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. That's the foundation. 
But it comes at a cost. That commandment means that we're going to turn aside from, from doing what we think and what we want and turning aside to Him. And then we experience that wonderful thing the Bible calls a new birth, being born from above that Jesus told Nicodemus about in John chapter 3. And Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, when we're buried with Him in baptism. Just like Jesus was buried, we're buried in water. And we come up, he says, a new creature. We come up a disciple. We come up a student. We come up a learner. We come up a pupil. And from that point on, we're to be taught to observe all things. It's a marvelous road. It's a marvelous trip, but one that comes at a cost. This morning, David's going to lead us in a, in a song we call an invitation song, and it's basically inviting people to become a disciple. Inviting people to experience that new birth. It's also inviting people to make a new commitment. Sometimes we get in a rut. Sometimes we get kind of fall back and, and we need to start over. And, and this is an opportunity to start over in being a disciple. Those are the things we need to think about. What do I need to do? Where am I and where do I want to be?